I've given you a list of resources there. We're not going to go over them now. Obviously, that's just um, some resources. The, the topic singleness is massive. So we're just, you know, there's a tiny little bit of it today. So there's just some examples of resources that I found helpful. And then one of them at the end there is a prayer for the unmarried. And the, um, the assistant minister, the associate minister at my church at Petersham, Mike Dicker, he adapted that prayer. There's a prayer for married in um, common, oh, common, what's it called, Peter? Common gatherings? No, common, common. What's the, the most recent one called? <laughs> common prayer or something. That sounds wrong. <laughs> anyway, he's, um, he adapted the prayer for the married to be for the prayer for the unmarried. So that might give you some ideas about prayers that you would like to include in your ministry situation. Okay, so just leave that there for you to have a look at later. Now, I just want you to um, think privately for a moment. What do you think of when you think of a single person? Okay, just, you may think of yourself. <laughs> Um, but what, what do you think of when you think of a single person? Okay, now this one, um, not privately, I'd like you to call out, what are, what are the different types of singleness? Widowed. Widowed? So, so, yeah, so never married, widowed, divorced, separated, divorced, separated. yep. And some people to be yep, some people choose to be single for a whole range of reasons, don't they? Yep. And you say someone is either chosen or because of life experiences is single and hasn't had children. Yep. Or the responsibilities. So it could be male or female, but especially for women. Yep. Yep. Some people um, are, are married, but they could actually feel single to a certain extent because of the health of their spouse. Their, health for, um, their spouse, for example, may be mentally really, really unwell and um, they may feel single in many ways. So yeah, there's unwanted singleness, there's chosen singleness, there's opposite sex attracted persons, there's same sex attracted persons, bisexual, gender confused persons, um, happily single, unhappily single, suddenly single again um, through divorce or death of a spouse. And there's a high chance many in the church will be single again. Um, there's biblical singleness, which is celibate, pursue purity, seen as a negative in the world's eyes, largely. And there's worldly singleness, which is potentially sexually active and may be sexually active with more than one partner. Too often singleness is defined by what um, it isn't. We can think it's all about not having certain things. And so therefore we can think of it in only negative ways. And so, and for you personally, for those of um, you who are single, you may be really struggling with your singleness at the moment and um, you may be um, struggling with it, but I hope after today um, you may have um, a little bit more encouragement in your singleness at this time, not to um, deny what you're feeling, but to um, have, a, have some encouragement. Yeah. Okay, so why does the whole church need to be clear about singleness and not just single people? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Thanks, Kath. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we need to love everyone. We need to be clear about actually what is God's word on singleness. It's interesting with passages like 1 Corinthians 7, they are directed to the whole church. They're not just directed to single people, are they? Yeah? Just like the, the church... All the church needs to know God's word on marriage as well. Okay, yeah, that's just that's just a little minor thing. We not, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I think sometimes when we have like a seminar on singleness, it's for the single people, you know. Um, so yeah, so making sure that 
um, it's in our preaching programs as well. And that's the real advantage of doing expository preaching, working through books of the Bible. These topics like these will end up coming up. Okay, so well, that's just some preliminary comments. I'm going to start with a confession. Okay, now you're probably really worried, thinking, oh no. <laughs> Is she going to reveal too much? Peter's looking very worried. <laughs> now, I get asked to give talks on a range of things and many of those things are, are very personal topics, things such as sexual intimacy, pornography, masturbation, marriage, divorce and remarriage. But basically, I never ever get asked to speak on singleness unless it's in, on a talk on 1 Corinthians 7. I get asked to recommend speakers to speak on singleness and at least twice um, last year I got asked to recommend speakers and um, some of those speakers I recommended or at least one of them is in this room <laughs> and he gave some great talks on singleness, <laughs> one of my colleagues here, Chris. Um, but since I organised the PNA conference and I get to choose the topics and speakers, I thought I'd give one on singleness. <laughs> so that is why I'm speaking on this topic. Um, <laughs> So I'm speaking on singleness because basically I never get asked to and I think singleness is an important topic. So that's my confession. Now what about distractions? I thought some of you um, might be distracted with some things, especially because there's a number of you, we don't know each other. You may be wondering, you know, why is she single? You know, how old is she? Da, da, da. So I'm just going to go through these things, okay? <laughs> okay, so... Some of you may be sitting there wondering a few things about me, so I thought I'd say a little bit about myself so you aren't distracted as I'm speaking, okay? So 10 points under distractions. One, I've never married. Two, I didn't choose to remain single, but I can't say I ever tried really hard to get married. Three, for me, there were medical reasons why I thought it would be probably be better not to have children. So although I would have loved to have children, I was hesitant for medical reasons. Four, I am very content being single. I wasn't always, but I have been content for many, many years now, for well over a decade, okay? Probably about 15 years or so. Um, five, I am heterosexual, so I don't struggle with same-sex attraction like some of you may, some of my good friends do, um, but opposite sex attraction. Six, I'm 50 years old. I turned 50 last Sunday. Still accepting presents. No, no, that's <laughs> like jokes. Um, seven, I, I lived by myself for many years when I started in vocational ministry and then a niece, one of my nieces moved in with me when she started university. She, her, she grew up in the country so she moved to Sydney for university. Um, she moved in for about five and a half years and she moved out a couple of months ago. Her two younger brothers um, still live with me. One has lived with me for four years and one has lived with me for two years and they're both at university. Um, eight, this is a very personal topic, isn't it? Um, some of you most likely will be disappointed by some things that I say. I'm not meaning to be offensive or I'm not meaning to be hurtful to you. Um, and that goes for whether you're single or married, um, particularly if you're single though. I won't touch on some things that maybe some of you will want me to speak on. Um, I'm not touching on some things I want to speak on. We just, you know, we have limited time, okay? Um, number nine, I've never struggled with being attracted to married men, which is brilliant since I work with and have for many, many years worked with many, many married men. But I know I could become attracted to a married man. In my brain, they're just never an option. Um, but I know I can deceive myself and believe Satan's lie, so I don't make excuses to begin spending time with married men. Number 10, I find that I'm more likely to struggle with singleness, be distracted um, by not being married when I'm preparing a talk on marriage or you know, sexual intimacy. But I know that it may be harder for a time and then in my experience, um, it becomes easier again, okay? So for those of you who may be 21 and you're, you know, there'll be you know, ups and downs potentially for yourself. Okay, so an example is a couple of years ago I was preparing a talk on 1 Corinthians 7 for Equip Women's Conference and I started being attracted to this guy, this single guy who I didn't even know and I started thinking about him and it was, it was like this huge ego blow to me because I thought I'm too old to be attracted to someone I don't even know, that's, that's really kind of high school-ish. <laughs> and I did speak to Kath, um, one of my friends about it anyway. 
I just thought that's ridiculous, but it was kind of good for me because it made me swallow my pride. And attraction is a weird thing, isn't it? Why did I think I was so mature that I would only be attracted to people I knew really well? Attraction is not always logical. Even though normally I would only be attracted to people I know really well, this attraction proved that um, things can change. I can be attracted to people without much good reason why. And no surprise, those types of attractions can easily, not always, but they can easily um, quickly stop since they weren't really based on anything at all. Okay, so that was 10 points by way of introducing myself. Maybe there's still a few questions you have in your mind. Actually, maybe if there is about me that is distracting you, do you want to ask it now and then we can move on? No, okay, everyone's fine. Okay, so point three, contentment. Um, well, some of those points, sorry, that um, I've just touched on, I'm gonna come back to them throughout the talk. But point three, contentment. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, please God, I know singleness is, is supposed to be good. I know Jesus was single. I know the Apostle Paul was. I know what 1 Corinthians 7 says but please may I not be single when I'm 50. <laughs> please may I not be like Jane and be single. Now, no one's laughing now because you're probably too embarrassed <laughs> to admit that you're thinking that. Now, if you're under 50, whether you're single or you're married now, it may be that when you're 50, you're single. For most of you, if not all, that's not a very pleasant thought, is it? But God just gives us one day at a time, doesn't he? Don't try and imagine what life will be like in 20 years time, for example. Live life now, live life today. And that very act of getting on and living your life will help you grow in your contentment. When I was in my, uh, in, in my 20s and early to mid 30s, I never imagined the contentment I've experienced for many years now. So it may well be that you become more content than you are now. The, that contentment came for me really just by keeping on being Christian, not being in denial about my single state, being honest about it, but coming back to God's promises, facing God, looking to God, not turning my back to him, trusting God at his word, that he says singleness is good, that I'm not someone lesser than my married friend, that I'm not incomplete because I don't have a husband, that I'm not lacking something as a human because I'm not sexually active. I'm not less of a woman because I don't have children. I'm not less feminine. God says in his word that singleness is good. And it's not just passages like 1 Corinthians 7 that make clear that singleness is good, but it's also the whole Bible, isn't it, where God's character is revealed, that he is not just in control of my marital state, but he's also working it out for my good. It's good and right that I am single. It's not just true that I am single, it's also good. It's good for me, but it's also good for other people that I'm single. I am single for the sake of the building of the church and so that those who don't yet know Jesus get to hear about him and have the opportunity to turn to him as their Lord and Saviour. Contentment for me didn't come by reading lots of books on singleness. There are some excellent books on singleness. I've never felt a big urge to read a lot of them. Some people do and find them helpful. Some people though are consumed by them and sadly there are some unhelpful books on singleness, just like there's some unhelpful books on marriage, unhelpful books on parenting. Unhelpful ones on singleness are ones that say, basically you are being disobedient if you're single um, or that you don't have enough faith or they just give you lots and lots of steps to tell you how to get married. So they're not really about singleness at all. They're not really about how you can serve the church with your gift of singleness. I think I have the gift of singleness because I'm single. I think you have the gift of marriage if you're married. Some people may find singleness easier than others, just like some find marriage easier than others. And also different, you know, different times in our lives we will find um, singleness easy, easier than other times if we're single and sometimes in your own marriage that will be easier than other times. 
but I think it's our actual state that is the gift and you may well disagree with me on that. So I think our gifts can change over time. You may currently have the gift of marriage, but you may have the gift of singleness again in the future um, if your spouse dies. Or you may have the gift of singleness now and you may get married in the future. What I found most helpful in regard to my singleness is actually just regularly sitting under God's word in sermons, in quiet times, in Bible studies. And I'm not saying that to try and sound pietistic or holy or anything, that's actually reality. That is what I have found to be the most helpful. So in many ways, some of the most helpful people for me in understanding what it means to be a single woman have actually been married men who have preached God's word to me faithfully week in and week out. They have taught me and helped me see what it means to live as a disciple of Christ, what it means to be a woman of God what it means to be single, this side of Jesus' return. They teach and help me keep things in eternal perspective. That helps me keep looking to God, fixing my eyes on Jesus, remembering God's good promises to me. It helps me not to believe Satan's deception that my life is, you know, it's not complete or that my life, you know, that I'm missing something, that I am worthless. Rather, the truth is my identity is foremost because I'm in Christ. My identity is not primarily because of my marital status, so I'm in Christ. And that takes us to point four on the outline. The main defining category is in Christ. Now, as I think of myself, the primary category I think of myself of being is in Christ. As humans, we are either in Christ or out of Christ. They are the only two options. There is no third option. And that status determines and shapes both our lives now, but also all of our eternity. Being in Christ now means I have God's spirit in me. It means I understand why I was created, and that's to glorify God. It means I understand what this life is all about. It means I understand where I am headed and it means my sin is paid for. It means I have been shown mercy by God in Jesus dying for my sin on the cross and it means I show grace to others. It means that I'm forced to think about and value other human beings as it's not just me and God, rather Jesus died for the sin of the world. God created all of humanity all of humanity are in the image of God. We want all humanity to hear the gospel. God is saving me, yes, but he's saving a people for himself, a bride for Christ, his church. And that is not just me by myself. So it helps me not be so individualistic, but more corporate, you know, more communal. It means that although I will die on this earth, unless Jesus comes back first, I'll be resurrected to eternal life. Now, you might just feel like you've just heard a doctrine one lecture or something or that Peter Jensen is um, going to start lecturing in doctrine. Um, now, I mentioned that in Christ is the primary category I think of myself in because I think it's really important that every human being articulates what is the primary category they think of themselves in. What is the primary category, and this is a rhetorical question, you think of yourself in? What is the primary category you think of yourself in. Being in Christ won't change. It won't change if my marital status changes. It won't change if I die. I will still be in Christ. I'm in relationship with him and he is constant. He doesn't change. He's faithful. He's true. His words are completely trustworthy. If my primary category to understand myself was, you know, being single, then that could change. Or if it was my age, or my health, my financial situation, all those um, change. So being in Christ is a constant through other things which are more temporary or you know, they're, they're just for a time, these other things. Some things are just for this world, they're just for this age. But being in Christ is eternal because God is eternal and our relationship with him is eternal. And I think that category helps you understand yourself whether it is that you're married or whether it is that you are single, okay? Now, number five, I'm um, change a bit of pace here. Um, 
some unhelpful things some people have said about synchronous. Um, now, some of this is hopefully, depending on your personality, some of you might feel like this is a bit in your face. Um, well, it's, it's going to be, I guess. <laughs> and some of you may, not, may think it's not in your face enough, OK? But we all regret things we say, don't we? Um, I certainly do. And if you know me at all, you know that I regret a number of things I say. I'm a very blunt, direct person, so we've got more opportunity to um, regret things we say, people like myself. Now, we can say stupid things about any area of life, can't we? Any of us can do that, um, including you know, marriage, parenthood. So I'm not saying these things because I think single people have the monopoly on calling out married people saying stupid things. I think we all say stupid things from time to time. It's part of being human. Once something has left our mouths, you know, it's public, it's out there, you know, we can't, you know, bring it back and like, you know, do a time warp machine. But we can be gracious with one another and we can also listen to one another and learn from each other things that others find unhelpful, okay? So that's the reason why I'm going to say these things. So here are some unhelpful things people have said. Um, Number one, when a married person tells someone other than their spouse that they find them attractive, okay? So the other person this married person could be attracted to, could, they could be single or married, couldn't they? Um, yes, married people may find other people attractive from time to time, but I don't see what good telling the person that person can do. Work out who it is you should tell, you know, your spouse, a good friend of the same sex, a church elder, you know, that, and, and by telling someone else that can help diffuse the situation. Sometimes it can help it go away very quickly. Telling someone, not the actual person, I think can help you be accountable. But I've seen a lot of harm come from a married person telling someone who is not their spouse that they're attracted to them. And the same is the case, um, you know, also is the case if someone's single or married and they tell someone who is, um, is married that they find them attractive. I think it's totally inappropriate. It's a potential disaster waiting to happen and has happened and, um, yeah, witnessed it, it going very, very badly. So, Chris, did you want to make any comments about that? No, I just thought, you, yeah, OK. Um, so number two, a few years back I was sitting under the grapevine just outside here at college, just, it's just near the morning tea area if you're not familiar, and I was waiting to speak to a student, there was no one around, people were in lectures, and an older man came up to me and I recognised this man, he was a father of a woman I knew, but we had never actually met, I just knew his face, and he was a mature Christian man, and he assumed I was a student wife, and when I said um, I wasn't married, he said, what went wrong? Know, what went wrong? Now, I immediately felt sorry for his two daughters and the pressure they might have felt from him from time to time to get married. Nothing had gone wrong with my life. But when a mature, you know, someone much older, a mature Christian person says that to me, you know, you can bring doubts in your mind, can't it? I'm not living plan B. My life is not lesser than his just because he is married. God says that singleness is good. And in the new creation, we're all going to be single. I don't know if that's news to you, but we're all going to be single, so there's no harm getting used to it now. Number three, a married guy I used to be at church with many years ago recently said to me, Jane, I would have asked you out, but I never thought you were interested in me. Well, he got that right. I was never romantically... <laughs> interested in him but why tell me now like this is you know years later he's married I think he thought it was a compliment to me maybe he thought that I thought you know maybe he thought I felt sorry for myself that I thought I was a bit of a loser a spinster and so the knowledge that he would have asked me out would make me feel better no actually it didn't make me feel better I, I just I just thought it was weird what about if I was actually attracted to him as well um, I'm not, but he didn't know that. It was just a weird comment coming from nowhere. We weren't, you know, as far as my memory calls, we weren't talking, we weren't even talking about marriage or anything. I definitely wasn't saying, I really want to be married. I wasn't having that conversation with that guy at all. Um, number four, a married man I worked with many years ago said to me, Jane, it's not like you're the last taxi cab off the rank, but I've just never been attracted to you. It's like you relate asexually. 
Now, <laughs> do you want me to say that again? I've definitely got that. <laughs> um, I think he meant that as a compliment. This is not how I answered him. I don't exactly remember how I answered, answered him at the time. I think I, I said nothing, actually. I think I was just kind of flawed. But this is my answer to his statement to you now, OK? A, I am a sexual being, OK? As are all healthy human beings, married or single. We are physical, sexual beings. That's part of us understanding what it means to be human. And Sam Aubrey has some excellent things to say on that. And you can look at that later in your resource list, OK? So, so he's got um, great articles, but also a great sermon series on that. B, why was he thinking of me in that category as, you know, a sexual or asexual being? Why was he not thinking of me as a sister in Christ and that maybe the way I was relating to him was because I was trying to be godly as someone who worked with him many days a week? C, in God's kindness, I was never attracted to this married man. I mean, we worked really, really well together as co-workers. And I think if he'd been single, I don't, I don't think I would have been attracted to him either. I don't know. I mean, this is impossible to know because I never knew him as a single person. But even in my non-romantic relating to him, I was never asexual relating to him. Yes, I didn't flirt, but I was still human. I was never subhuman, OK? less of a human. Now, if you're thinking, OK, I don't understand what it means to, that, that we're actually physical, that we're actual sexual beings and all that, I really strongly recommend um, you listen to Sam Aubrey's um, sermon series there. They're really, really helpful, OK? Because it's, it's really, really important in understanding what it means to be human, whether we're single or married. Um, number five. Being asked the question, why aren't you married? Now, I found that a difficult question to answer when I was in my 20s. Um, people actually stop asking you when you get older. So, and I, I, wouldn't, have, I don't, wouldn't find it a, you know, a problem at all as I got older. But maybe if you're wondering that about someone and they're younger, maybe a more gentle approach rather than, why aren't you married? Because I got asked that quite a lot in my 20s. But that potentially could be a helpful conversation. But um, some people may find that a hard question to answer, OK? And in a sense, you're, you need to have some sort of relationship because you're, you know, you're demanding an answer from them, OK? Um, number six, a friend of mine was at someone's house and their son asked his mum, so asked my friend's friend, I hope this is not getting too complicated, why she wasn't married. Now, his mum said, well, some people are married, some aren't. She hasn't met the right guy yet. The son said that he could marry her when he grew up, but then said, oh, wait, she's probably be dead when I get older. Now, that, that's funny in one sense. My friend found it helpful that the mother, so her friend said to her son that some people are married, some people aren't. But she wished that her friend would have left it there rather than adding, you know, she hasn't met the right guy yet. Now, often people will say that because they think, oh, this woman or this man, you know, is lovely, they just haven't met the right person yet. But then there's a number of people who just actually find that unhelpful. You know, just, I may never, you know, that person may never get married just, you know, accept me now as a single person. That may be the case for the rest of my life. Seven, a father of the bride, he's also a Christian minister, said in his speech at the wedding that the man his daughter just married had saved her from becoming a crazy cat lady. Now, that got some laughs, but what was his daughter saved from? You know, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a typical joke, isn't it, in Australian culture and in, a, in our Christian culture as well. But actually, what is his daughter actually saved from? His daughter was no longer going to turn into an older single woman with lots of cats. But it's a really negative stereotype, isn't it? And it's really living in fear. And it's ignoring God's word that singleness is good. I think, you know, she could have turned into a cool cat lady. I mean, I don't personally like cats myself, but you know, she could be older and single and actually be really cool, a great Christian role model. And you know, why does she have to be crazy? Um, number eight, a woman I know was going to go on the Liberty Committee. So if you haven't heard of Liberty, it's a Christian ministry that um, helps people struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction and also helps um, their family and friends as well. Okay. And so if you want to access that resource, just go on to Liberty Christian Ministries website. They've got some really great help. Now, she was thinking about going onto that committee 
Um, my friend doesn't struggle with same-sex attraction, but she recognised that it's a good ministry and thought it would be a good committee to go on. That it's important that the committee is made up of a mix of people, you know, young, old, male, female, heterosexual, and those struggling with same-sex attraction. Well, a good friend of theirs um, found out that they were thinking of joining the committee and said to them, aren't you worried that people think, will think that you are a lesbian? Aren't you worried that people will think that you're a lesbian? Now, as if joining the committee will make people less you know, likely want to marry her. Now, in my mind, I think that's, a really, that's really living in fear. And in, just, in my mind, I think that's just crazy stupid. And also that mindset, it really has the potential to isolate our Christian brothers and sisters who do struggle with same-sex attraction, okay? I used to be on that Committee of Liberty. If you get asked to be on it, yeah, please strongly consider it, whatever your sexual orientation is. And if someone really wants to ask you out, they're going to ask you out, I think, anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, number 10. Another unhelpful thing someone said to me was, Jane, women who look like you and I have to try harder. Now, this poor woman, it was, she was quite a bit younger than me. She was, it was when I was living in London and she's Australian. She came to stay with me for a bit. And it was good that maybe she didn't say it when I was 23 or something. Um, she said it when I was about 40 and I was, I was very secure and very content. And so I, I was able to hear that through her own insecurities and everything, but also obviously hearing she doesn't think I'm gonna be on the cover of Vogue, <laughs> but that, that was fine with me. I was quite fine about that. But I just think that, I hope she doesn't say that sort of thing to a lot of other people, male or female, yeah. Um, and crazy logic. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so that's a bit of the negative. Number six, some helpful things some people have said about singleness. Now, one of my bosses, Phil Wheeler, who's um, going to be, some of you may be going to his elective after following afternoon tea. I worked with him a number of years ago in two different churches. He's, he's said a number of brilliant, wise things to me over the years, um, and this is one of them. What Phil said to me, what really matters is not whether you've had a child but whether you are a child of God. Um, what really matters is not whether you've had a child, but whether you are a child of God. Now, obviously, that's a great comfort um, to those married, unable to have children as well, isn't it? So it's not just for the single person. Um, yeah. And also for those of you who have had children, it's true. Okay. Um, it was just very timely. It wasn't like, I, I wasn't, I, it wasn't that I was particularly struggling at the time with not being able to have children, but it was just very timely when Phil said that. Secondly, John Chapman. Um, so John Chapman died um, a number of years ago. He was an older single man itinerant ministry in Sydney. And you've got a quote from John on your outline, the quote I'm going to read now. So it's quite long if you'd like to follow it. One of the things that is, sorry, and he was, he, this is from a sermon that he gave at his home church at Hurstville Grove. Okay, is anyone from Hurstville Grove Church here? No. Okay, so this is his home church. One of the things that has always been nice for me in this congregation as a single person is I always get treated like a person. I don't know if you ever think about me as, a, as being single, but I never think of myself as being single. Obviously, he's overstating the case. He would think of himself as single sometimes. And I don't think of you as being married. I mean, it has never occurred to me to sort of categorise people like that. I just think about you as you and that's how I want you to think about me as me and don't think about me as me in transit to some other condition. I might be in transit although I think I'm not but there are single people in this congregation who I think probably may be in transit and if they are think about them as they are right now. Let me tell you the temptations of single people so that you can pray about them and help them. Their two biggest temptations are that of sexual fantasy and loneliness, and they are not too far removed from each other in my judgment. Can I just say to the singles, it might be the temptation of everybody for all I know, but it is specifically ours, and it is unhelpful to dwell on either of them. But you ought to take action and not just mope around, okay? I can imagine Chapo saying that as well if you've met him. You can always turn your loneliness into something else by ringing somebody or by inviting them to your place, but take action and take positive action in regard to that, okay? Um, I'm not sure if that sermon is still on Hurstville Grove website, but um, 
yeah, there's more of it in Chapo and also in the new collection of Chapo um, articles that um, Dave Mansfield has edited. Um, and that they're on your resources. Um, number three, celibacy is not bad for you. Okay, so that's just a helpful thing someone has said. And number four, which is very, very similar to what I just said then, no one ever died from not having sex. No one ever died from not having sex. Now, the sexualization of our culture, we find that hard to believe at times. To be fully human, you need to be having sex. With who? That doesn't matter so much. And it's so important to keep teaching the truth that you are fully human, whether you are sexually active or not. Our culture makes fun of the 40-year virgin, doesn't it? Five, I think it's important to remember that the norm of life, the norm of this life, post Genesis 3, before Jesus returns, is suffering, okay? So the norm of life is suffering. The norm of life is not that I'm going to get everything I want, you know, God wants me to be happy, okay? The norm of life is suffering. That doesn't mean that there's not lots of good gifts, but yeah, this, this world is groaning. Number six, God has given us a Christian family. God has given us a Christian family. Number seven, friendships. Now, friendships are very important for each one of us, whether we're single or married. And good friendships, um, for those of you who are married, apart from your spouse, they actually help marriages function better. Vaughan Roberts, who is a single man, and he doesn't expect to get married as he struggles with same-sex attraction, has written some helpful things about the importance of Christian friendship and how he's realised as he's got older, he's just a couple of years older than me, how it's actually, he's neglected them more in the past, he's realised more and more how important Christian friendship is and the good gift it is from God. So to nurture, nurture friendships, whatever age it is um, that we are. In a highly sexualised culture, we can be suspicious of friendships, even of the same sex with heterosexual people. And in our highly individual culture, we can neglect God's good gift to us in friendship. So just a reminder that they take time, they take effort, but they're a good gift from God for us. Now, number eight, this is from Sam Aubrey, who, like Vaughan, he's also um, English and he also struggles with same-sex attraction. Um, I've mentioned him already. Um, he's got a book coming out on singleness, which is expected in 2019. Really looking forward to that book. I think it's going to be really, really helpful. And I mentioned again, um, yeah, listen to his sermon series from his home church on why we're physical. I think it's just very, very helpful. Okay, so this, this quote is from a Gospel Coalition um, um, article of his, and you've got it there on your outline, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, we know we are sexual beings. We know this sexuality is meant to mean something, but unless we know what our sexuality is for, we won't understand how it's meant to work. The best we'll be able to do is try to get some passing entertainment from it. The architecture of the Bible points us to the purpose of why we're sexual beings. Scripture begins with a marriage, Adam and Eve, and it ends with a marriage, Christ and his church. And the former is the trailer for the later. The joining together of the man and the woman is a picture of how heaven and earth will one day be joined together through the union of Jesus and his people. This connection is reflected throughout the Bible. Song of Song uses the mutual delight and intimacy of a husband and wife to reflect the delight of Christ and his people. The prophets frequently use marital language to describe God's relationship with his people. He is the groom and they are the frequently wayward bride. Jesus picks up this language in the Gospels, describing himself as the bridegroom, for example, in Mark 2. Paul teaches the Corinthians that just as man and his wife become one flesh, those who join themselves to Christ become one in spirit with him, 1 Corinthians 6. And in Ephesians 5, he goes on to say that the mystery behind human marriage is, as we now see it's always been, Christ's relationship to the church. Human marriage then reflects the big story of the Bible, the big thing God is doing in the universe, making a people for his son. And this story provides the key to understanding our sexuality. It also accounts for why the Bible defined marriage as between one man and one woman, rather than two persons of the same sex. In Matthew 19, Jesus connects the phenomenon of marriage with the fact of our having been created male and female. Marriage is predicated on gender difference. It's because we're male and female that we have this thing called marriage. Jesus then goes on to show that the only godly alternative to marriage is singleness. When the disciples balk at the intended lifelong implications of marriage, 
Jesus points them to the example of the eunuchs, the long-term singles of his day. If marriage is too much commitment, there's the option of celibacy. Jesus gives no third alternative, whether cohabitation or some alternative construal of marriage. For marriage to be a parable of Christ and the church, it must be like and unlike male and female. Change this arrangement and you end up distorting the spiritual reality to which it points. Alter marriage and you end up distorting a picture of the gospel itself. The vision of marriage helps us keep it in healthy perspective. Grasping what it points to means we won't demean or trivialize it. And it also means we won't idolize it. Marriage is not ultimate, but it points to the thing that is. Marriage itself is not meant to fulfill us, but to point to the thing that does. So if this is the ultimate purpose of marriage, where does that leave singleness? Are those of us who are celibate wasting our sexuality by not giving expression to our sexual desires? It means singleness, like marriage, has a unique way of testifying to the gospel of grace. Jesus said there will be no marriage in the new creation. In that respect, we'll be like the angels, neither marrying nor given in marriage. We will have the reality. We will no longer need the signpost. By foregoing marriage now, singleness is a way of both anticipating this reality and testifying to its goodness. It's a way of saying this future reality is so certain that we can live according to it now. If marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. Okay? If marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. It's a way of declaring to a world obsessed with sexual and romantic intimacy that these things are not ultimate and that in Christ we possess what is. This doesn't mean our sexual feelings are redundant, dangling unfulfilled like the equivalent of an appendix. The consummation our sexual feelings long for can, if we let them, point us to a greater consummation to come. They remind us that what we forego on a temporal plane now, we will enjoy in fullness in the new creation for eternity. Sexual unfulfillment itself becomes a means of deepening our sense of the fuller, deeper satisfaction we await in Jesus. It helps us to hunger more for him. We skip the appetizer, but we await the entree. Celibacy isn't a waste of our sexuality. It's a wonderful way of fulfilling it. It's allowing our sexual feelings to point us to the reality of the gospel. We will never ultimately make sense of what our sexuality is unless we know what it is for, to point us to God's love for us in Christ. Um, yeah. So if you've never heard Sam before, he's brilliant. I'll just say that again. We are good friends, a bit of a fan club. But yeah, I'm looking forward to his book, okay? Um, Peter, did you want to make any comments on Sam's extended quote there? Yeah. Yeah, it's very helpful, yeah. So good. Yeah. Marriage shows the shape of the signal shows the Yeah. That's where the price of admission. Yeah. I think, I, think, um, I, think um, I mean, you may be struggling yourselves, but also pastorally, um, you may find, um, even if someone doesn't articulate it, so it'd be good if you articulate it, um, potentially say it, some single people, some celibate people, or in marriages where there's no longer sexual intimacy because of health reasons or whatever, break, breaking down. Um, actually what is the purpose of actually being a physical sexual being okay so trying to get a bit more of a handle on that um, potentially will be helpful for you pastorally okay and Sam just has an accessible way of I think being able to teach it and communicate it that may be a new concept for you but it will potentially if it hasn't already come up for you pastorally like so I think what's you know wouldn't it just be easier for me as someone who's not sexually active who's, who's never going to have kids why have I had to menstruate why do I have to go through you know all these things like that okay yeah why do you have to have a sex drive things like that okay so being able to answer that could be really helpful pastorally um, for your own contentment but also as you're ministering with others okay um, 
Now, so Vaughan and Sam are both friends of mine. Um, this next quote is from Bethany Jenkins, and I've never met her. Um, it's also from the Gospel Coalition US website, and it's called Turning 40 While Single and Childless. Okay, so from Bethany. In C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, the narrator and his guide visit heaven and encounter a ghost named Sarah Smith. The narrator immediately recognises Sarah as a person of particular importance because she's surrounded by young men and women. Describing them as her sons and daughters, the guide explains, every young man or boy that met her became her son, even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. Her motherhood was of a different kind. Those on whom it fell went back to their natural parents, loving them more. Sarah Smith's motherhood wasn't biological, but spiritual. Her children were born through faith, not through sex. As a Christian, I worship a man who was a biologically childless parent. Jesus Christ never married, never had kids, yet he said, behold, I and the children God has given me. In Hebrews 2 and consider what the prophet says of him when his soul becomes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied in Isaiah 53 Jesus never held a son or daughter in his arms but he nonetheless came to bear children to give birth to a people like me and perhaps you who now bear his family resemblance to be clear, having spiritual children isn't the same as having biological or adoptive, or I would add, you know, foster children. But just because it isn't the same doesn't mean it can't satisfy. The family of God is expansive, uniting the old and the young, the black and the white, the orphan and the widow, the single and the married. When I look upon the families who have brought me into their homes, loving me and giving me children to love, I realize I am already a single mother by choice even if our only bond is one of faith and love, okay? And I'll come back to that later about spiritual parenthood. Um, number 10, in the unhelpful list, um, I, gave, I gave an example of what one father of the bride, who's also a minister, said in his um, speech. This now is an example of a father of the groom um, at a different wedding. And a number of you know this man. Um, and actually Emma works with him in Tamworth. Um, this man is also a minister. It was at a wedding I was at last year and the father of the groom said this, my name is Xavier and I'm the very proud father of the groom. I'd like to start by saying on behalf of my wife Libby and I, thank you to you all. We are delighted to be able to share Zach and Becca's joy with so many of you who love them and who are here to support them in the promises they have made to each other. And Xavier then continued on for a bit, sharing some you know, funny stories about Zach, about Zach growing up, um, also talking about his Christian character and his Christian maturity, his Christian commitment. And then Xavier said, so he's talking on behalf of him and his wife Libby, we taught him that should he remain single, that would be a good thing. That he should marry, that would be a good thing too. And that should he choose to marry, we pray that he would marry one who loves Jesus as well. Now Xavier saying that I think was so very helpful. It was helpful that Zach had that growing up, that his parents acknowledged he may remain single and if he did, that would be good. It was also helpful for everyone at the wedding to hear that and at a wedding to hear that. When some single men and women can feel their singleness so much, so that simple comment from Xavier was actually a very profound truth and such brilliant timing. It helped give us single women and men their dignity and comfort. And why? Because Xavier spoke God's truth into the situation. Singleness is good and so much in our culture and in much of our Christian culture shouts to us that it is not good, that it is somehow lesser. Now, number 11. Now, this one is not actually about singleness, but I think it's very fitting. And I just fa I've just found it helpful in the last few years as I've done a bit more work on the Puritans. So it's, they're from the Puritans. Um, just when you read a number of them, this saying that, you know, this life is all about getting ready for the next. I just found that helpful saying. Have that in my mind. Have that close to you. This life is all about getting ready for the next. And that really helps us understand the goodness of singleness, I think, as well. And also another of the Puritan sayings, sit loose to this world, sit loose to this world, okay? Um, I think that 
helps you as a married person as well. But yeah, I think it, I just found it really helpful. Sit loose to this world. Okay, um, I've talked for quite a bit. Anyone want to make a comment or anything? Because we're, we've got quite a while to go. <laughs> Kath, did you want to make any comments? No? <laughs> Anyone? Ma Julia, did you want to say anything? Chris, are you going to, you're going to say no as well, aren't you? Yeah, it's very helpful. Chris, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just going to put Chris on the spot. Chris um, is on faculty at college as well, and um, he's also um, single. And he's done some brilliant talks on singleness. But, yeah, do you not want to say anything, Chris? No, no, just Sorry, it's very female centric. So. Yeah. Megan, did you want to say anything? Thanks for what you've said so far. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or Emma, or. Jackie, I mean, a number of you are number of you are in pastoral situations, looking after a lot of single men and women as well. Emma, sorry, did you want to say something? Thinking, um, Can you just speak a bit louder so I make sure everyone hears? Yeah, sure. We we'll might come back to that later at the end. Yeah, if you want to bring that back, um, question time. We end up having enough time for question time. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. Um, I think part of it is keeping on speaking God's word into, uh, obviously listening and speaking God's word and acknowledging grief. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but um, not becoming consumed by it actually as well. Yeah. Um, remembering why we were created and that's actually like serving others and that actually can help us move on in being content. Okay, so myths about singleness. Um, one, singles are not mothers or fathers. Obviously, you can be single and be a, a mother or father to biological or adoptive or foster, ch foster children. But what I mean is that as Christians, each one of us are spiritual mothers and fathers and I've touched on this already. But married people are parents to children, not just their own, as they teach and model them God's ways, just as single people are. We have a family that lasts for eternity. Our parenting has eternal consequences. And I think we keep forgetting about that, that we're spiritual parents. So we think the Apostle Paul was, and then it's like it stopped in the first century or like it stopped with the apostles. But actually, it's the case for each of us as well. Okay. Um, second myth, there is no place for singleness in complementarianism. Some interpretations of complementarianism seem to suggest that complementarianism only works out in marriage, that basically you have to get married and that, that, that they seem to have no category for the single Christian. Um, it's, I think it's a very narrow view of complementarianism and I was having dinner once at the principal's house um, when John Woodhouse was the principal here at Moore and he, had, um, he and Moya had some guests over for dinner and one of them was asking me about what I did at college and what the Priscilla and Aquila Centre was all about and they were someone in vocational ministry themselves. Um, they had been training ministry workers and ministry workers wives for years and they were confused about what complementarianism looked like beyond marriage. They just, they just I think they did, they, they, kept, they just were confused anyway. And I was, yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, it was a confusing conversation. But anyway, you don't start becoming a woman once you get married and you don't start becoming a man once you get married. God has a plan for men and women together to build his church and to reach the lost. That is complementarianism, okay? Doing that together. Some of this plan is done within marriage. Some of this is done in the church family more generally with our different gifts and abilities, okay? I mean, that could be a whole conference, okay? And maybe it will be one day. Um, third myth, all single people are weird, just like, um, <laughs> you might think that, hopefully you don't. <laughs> you need to get out more, I think, anyway. Um, but it's a kind of a myth. Um, so just like not all mar married people are normal, are they? <laughs> There's a wide range. It's great. It's good. Fourth myth, all older single women love cats and the colour purple. That, you know. <laughs> but even if they do, you know, whoopie doopie, like who cares, you know? Um, it doesn't really matter, does it? They might be the most brilliant Christians you'll ever meet, um, okay? Fifth myth, 
fifth myth, fifth, <laughs> fifth myth um, they are not complete. Uh, it can feel like in some Christian circles that someone who is not married is not complete and that just gets more compounded if someone doesn't have children. Okay, so I'm purposely repeating some of these things, okay, from before because some of us need to be reminded of these truths, okay, and be comforted at this time. Um, it's kind of almost like, we, you know, we haven't graduated in Christian circles, um, you know, if, if you know, we're not married or if we haven't had children. It's interesting, isn't it, that we in our Christian subcultures rightly critique the prosperity gospel, but we can have so much of it ourselves, actually, you know, just in terms of materialism, but also with our obsession on marriage and having children. Now, don't get me wrong, they are very, very good gifts from God. Um, I have benefited greatly from coming from a very large family. I've got five siblings, over 30 first cousins who we, we see, you know, um, who are brilliant. You know, a number of people don't know their cousins' names. Um, we know all our cousins, okay? Lovely uncles and aunts, but life, you know, both my parents are still alive. They're elderly, but still alive. Like, I've got a great family. But life here on this earth is so very short and we need to make sure we don't become consumed by the here and now. We need to remember what marriage and what singleness point us to, the grace of the gospel and the sufficiency of the gospel, okay? Number six, um, myth. Singleness is a problem to be solved. Singleness is a problem to be solved. Now, obviously, if two people want to be set up, that's great. Um, but singleness is not a problem to be solved. I've set people up who want to be set up and you know, some of those people are married. Number seven, you can only be significant with a significant other. Um, no, every human being is significant, aren't they? Um, young, from you know, conception to the grave, um, old, young, handicapped, single, married, whatever, colour, creed, every human being is significant. Um, eighth myth, God is punishing us. God is punishing us. And that can be, um, depending on um, your personality, your emotional makeup, what you've also been taught Christian-wise, you can believe that God is punishing you um, if you're single and you don't want to be single, okay? We can think, but you know, I've been godly. Why aren't I married, you know? They're married and, you know, and we can think things like, but you know, they had sex before marriage and they ended up being able to get married or they've only just become a Christian and they were able to get married. I've been a Christian for years, you know? Now these show our assumptions about God that somehow we think that God owes us something or that Jesus' death wasn't sufficient for our sins, that we think our good deeds, or these punsy deeds, um, contribute to our salvation. In any life situation we're suffering in, we should reflect on what God is teaching us in that situation. And key to understanding this then transforms our character and also our knowledge of God. Um, someone once said, God does actually give us more than we can handle, so we can rely on him, okay? God's strength is made perfect in our weakness when we admit we can't do it, not in our strength. When we admit we can't handle being single, we are more likely to talk to God about that, to pray to him, um, to try and get his perspective on it. And we become stronger as a result. His strength grows in our weakness. We see things more from his perspective, okay? So remember, singleness is not punishment for our imperfection, right? Um, and I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Number nine, singleness is bad for you. Singleness is bad for you. Virginity is seen as absurd. Um, virgin at 40 is seen as ridiculous, or virgin at 30, virgin at 20 is seen as ridiculous in our culture. Some see it as harmful, actually, to go without sex, without sexual intimacy, that you're damaging yourself, that you don't really understand what it means to be a human being, that you can't really experience what it means to be truly human, and that it's not good, that it's bad. And sometimes our thinking in our churches is pretty similar to this. Um, we can think that the single person is someone who's not sorted. The single person may be someone that's not sorted. The married person may be someone that's not sorted in some ways, but yeah. Um, number 11, another myth is singleness is easy if you have the gift of singleness. Now, I've already said that I think the gift is actually just the state. Um, but we can also think that um, a single person has an absence of any sexual desire. Um, they, they look like they're just doing singleness really, really well. Um, now, I think this introduces a tension in God's word. Um, you're single and you don't have the gift. Does that mean you can't be celibate? Um, 
you can always choose to be sell it. It's a way of saying singleness is really awful, it's really second rate, it's horrible. Some people are given a superpower to cope with it, as if, you know, some people have the gift of singleness and some people don't. Also, what is to say someone who is married that they don't have the gift and therefore they should no longer be married? Um, now, I, I don't know if I've been very clear there. I feel like I haven't been as I've been saying that. I thought it was clear when I was writing it. So email me if you've got any questions. Um, I think it also means some will say they don't have the gift of singleness, but they will never have the opportunity to marry. So um, what, are, what are they to think about their single state? I think Paul is someone, uh, sorry, I think Paul is saying some have the opportunity to be single, some have the opportunity to be married. And I think that is, that is the gift, okay? That's the situation. It is a situation you are in. It is either one or the other. It's a level playing field. Both are gifts from God. Now, this is good news. I think this is great news. We both have the goodness of God. It's not like, oh, I've been given the special gift of singleness, so I find it easy. I've been given this great gift from God. But yeah, bad luck. I'm just going to make up someone's name here. <laughs> Hopefully it's not Fred. <laughs> There's nothing. Um, you know, sorry, you don't have the gift of singleness. And so God is withholding something good from you. Yeah. Anyway, it's a contested area. Christians think differently about the whole gift. But the reality is, God is, even if, you, even if you don't want to admit, or sorry, even if you don't agree that um, singleness, um, everyone who's single has the gift of singleness, um, I think you do need to wrestle with the fact that our God is a good God and um, he wants what's best for you, okay? And so if you're, if you're not comfortable using the language that you've got the gift of singleness, um, come back to the character of God, okay? Um, Okay, and that might be more helpful. Okay, another myth, it, myth is that singleness is isolating, okay? Now that can sound like, but it is, you know, Jane, it is isolating. So, well, I just want to challenge that thinking a bit. People can think that being single, you have no family and so no intimacy and so you're on your own, that this was, but you know, when we look at the Apostle Paul, that was not the case for him. We can think intimacy and sex are the same thing, that it's one thing. We find it hard to believe there's intimacy that is not sexual. Yet this is quite a recent way to think and it's a very Western way to think. We've downgraded other intimacy, for example, friendship. We can be suspicious of friendships and think that oh, they must be you know, gay or lesbian and they must be sexual. We can think if you're not having sex, you're lacking intimacy. But it's interesting, isn't it, in the Bible, friendship is deep and it's intimate. Um, so Jesus in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Jesus is saying, everything the Father has revealed to me, I have revealed to you. A friend is someone who opens up. And verses and passages that I find, found helpful are Proverbs. You know, they talk about someone who knows your inner soul, your friend, someone that you can completely trust with and trust, you know, trust things with. And when I've gone through hard times, when I do, like two of my closest friends are in the room, Julia and Kath, and I was going through a particularly hard time last year, and um, old, old scene from years ago came back up and it, it made me doubt myself, made me doubt my relationship with God and whether I should still be in vocational ministry. And it was really, really helpful to speak to Kath about that and get wise counsel from that. But it's someone in a sense who knows your inner soul and um, you can't be wise without friends, okay? Um, yeah, okay. There's other passages that are helpful as well, um, yeah. Anyway, I might just leave that for now. And I talked about the importance of spiritual um, parenting. Just want to say again, um, singleness, the, another myth is singleness is a waste of your sexuality. Just in case you're wondering if this is a bit of a hobby horse, it is because I, I think it basically hardly ever gets talked about, but it is a really big pastoral problem, I think, for many people. Okay, you don't need to satisfy your sexual desire to fulfill your sexuality, okay? Now that might sound like that doesn't make sense, but that's true, okay? The purpose ultimately why God has created us as sexual beings is to understand the ultimate reality of Christ and the church. Marriage is to point to the relationship between Christ and the church. We can think marriage can make us whole. Some Christians say of their spouse, what really should only be said of Jesus. If you find your marriage disappointing at times, bear in mind you were meant to. Singleness has a unique way of testifying to the reality in a new age. I can forego marriage now because that reality is so real, I can testify to the goodness of it now, okay? Another myth is that singleness is unfulfilling. 
Jesus said he is the bread of life. He's the only one who can satisfy us at the deepest level. And so the key to being content in singleness is being content in Christ as a single person, just as a married person in Christ as a married person, okay? Um, and then um, another myth is that, the final myth is that marriage is the goal of a Christian life. And so basically then as a single person, you're a failure. Um, um, I think we can idolise marriage. We need to be careful, um, especially nowadays, in our defence of marriage, um, and we need to defend it. Um, we can be so much, we can be in the danger of not actually speaking properly about singleness. I think if our churches and our ministry situations, if we have a really strong theology of singleness and we're teaching that clearly, that's going to give a lot of hope to our world, to our churches, but also to our world, whatever their sexual persuasion, whatever their gender identifying preferences and everything else, okay? Okay, things to watch out for as single people, okay? Um, what's the time? Um, I wonder if it might be better to... Yeah, okay. Things to watch out for as single people. So trust God, trust God at his word. Ultimately, it's about trusting God, trusting God at his word. This trust then transforms our fantasies. We can keep thinking life is all about whether you're single or whether you're married, yet that is not a right way of thinking. Life is all about whether you are in Christ or out of Christ. They are the two choices we all face. That is what should be dominating our thinking. That then transforms who you are as a married person and who I am as a single woman. Um, another thing to watch out for is to trust God for the future. Trust God for the future. We can live in fear. You know, who's going to look after me if I get sick? Who will look after me when I get old? Who will turn up at my funeral? Well, you're going to be dead, so it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> Jesus will welcome you. You know, well done, good and faithful servant. In terms of who will look after us when we are older, that is when the church family really should shine, isn't it? Even those of us with spouses and children and grandchildren, it's likely that when we are older, that the church family will also need to help look after us. Anne Benton, who is a minister's wife in the UK, has spoken and written about looking after older people, and that book is on the resource list, and how much the church family helped her when her father-in-law moved in with them. She couldn't do it by herself. Other women from the church helped her. Um, another thing to look out for is to beware of victim mentality. Um, now, um, this is probably, these couple of points I may offend some Christian, um, some single people. There will be some things that you want to cry about, some things that you want to complain about, but watch that you don't end up becoming someone who everyone else needs to fix your problems. It's very unattractive. And also as a single woman, and the older you get, I think it can be very hard for people to challenge you potentially. It's like you're a protected species and people, some, I think some people feel like it's a, a bit too scary to actually challenge you on some things. So watch that, okay? Watch it that you're not too defensive, not too sensitive. Um, watch it, make, just make sure that you just keep having a sense of humour and being able to laugh at yourself. Um, watch also that you cultivate thankfulness. The sign of a believer is thankfulness, isn't it? And the sign of an unbeliever is unthankfulness. It will help you grow in contentment and see things and people from God's perspective. It helps diffuse things. It helps you have a more realistic picture about what is really happening around you. Thankfulness also helps develop perseverance and resilience. So it's got lots of cash value, okay? Brilliant flow and effects. Obviously, that's true if you're married as well. Um, another one, we can become defensive, paranoid and think that others think that we're such and such, you know, because we're single. You know, that we can think that other people think we're weird because we're single. Don't try and imagine what other people think of you, okay? Rather, we need to remember to love others and then we'll actually become more and more attractive and less weird if we, if we, if we were weird to start off with <laughs> and we'll become less paranoid and more content, okay? Another thing to watch out for, to make sure our hurts and pains are not to lead, to hurt, uh, are not to lead us to hurt others, okay? Another thing to watch out for is just to live your life, okay? Initiate, invite, be a leader. And for those of you who are in vocational ministry, be a leader, okay? Don't keep saying, I have no one to go on holidays with. It might be that you need to initiate that, okay? I'm sorry if I'm offending you. I'm just going to say it, okay? 
um, your life is actually going to be more attracted to others and um, whatever their marital status, okay? It might be hard and painful at times, but you yeah, don't live in fear. Just take some initiative, okay? But also another thing to watch out for is be real about some of the hardships, okay? There are real griefs in being single. For example, the cost of housing for some single people, they can't afford to live by themselves and they would love to, okay? The loss of companionship, of sexual intimacy, of having children, um, obviously you know, some, of them, some single people do have children, um, loneliness. So be real about all those things and have some trusted and wise and frank friends who will give you wise counsel and comfort. But in all of it, keep looking to Jesus in it all. And I would say that, Emma, in terms of your friends, just to, to be frank and honest, but to help them to keep looking to Jesus in it all. Um, another thing to watch out for, to make the most of the flexibility singleness gives you. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm single and I'm actually not that flexible, but generally it's true that singles are flexible, okay? So I have a twin brother who's married with four young children. The oldest is 13, um, so he obviously had children a bit later, and that, that child lives overseas with the mother. So there's complications there, going, visiting her overseas and things like that. The other three, his youngest daughters live with him and his wife. They are eight, six and four. I have so much more flexibility in my life um, than my brother, than my twin brother David. I have flexibility to choose to do very selfish things. Um, so I've got to watch out for that. But I have also the flexibility to, to choose to do good. So I think flexibility is like a superpower, okay? You've got the, you know, you can choose to do good, okay? So say for example, I try and have breakfast each Saturday morning with my mother. We go out to a cafe. It's a good way of getting her out of the house. She no longer drives. My father is becoming more unwell with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so it's great that I'm able to do that. If I was married, maybe I would be able to do that. Maybe I wouldn't, you know, I'm not, I don't know. But I'd have other people to consider, wouldn't I? My, my husband and potentially children to consider. But I don't have to consider other people. I just have to consider Jane and going and visiting my parents. And those breakfasts with my mum have been very, become very, you know, they're, they're just very special. We can assume that we are the ones doing them a favour, you know. Um, or you may feel sorry for me and think, oh, a spinster daughter has to have, you know, um, breakfast with her mother. Um, Actually, my mum's lovely. Julia wants to be adopted by my mum. She's told me a number of times. Um, I think it's a real lie from the devil. Um, you know, if you're actually kind of feeling sorry for me having breakfast with my mother. Um, my mum has been such a blessing to me. She has been so kind and generous and gracious to me. Now, I know some of you may have very tricky and difficult relationships with your parents. Um, so I'm not saying that go and have breakfast with your mother or father, whatever. Um, I'm just saying that the flexibility of me being a single person and living in the same city has been really, really brilliant and it's been a real privilege and a great blessing from God for me. Now this one is really for people in vocational ministry. Um, be aware of the narrative you are telling yourself about what exhausts you and weigh it from time to time, okay? So be aware of the narrative you are telling yourself, okay, what you know, what actually, what actually exhausts me and weigh it from time to time, you know, because it may, it may change, but you may be feeding the same old story, which may not actually be true. Now, some of the things we feel too exhausted to do, too busy to do, or we feel they won't refresh us can be the very things that actually do at times refresh us, okay? And again, Phil Wheeler, um, previous boss, um, in, when I was in parish, and also we were co-workers at a previous church before that, he was really, really helpful um, for me in understanding this, okay? Um, we can extend ourselves and we can imagine the scenario is worse than the reality. Sometimes the reality may be even worse, <laughs> but you know, a lot of times it's not. And I found this true again and again. And an example is, um, I agreed, agreed to speak at a women's conference um, for a church and I wrongly assumed that it was just going to be a Saturday and it was going to be just at their church which is not too far away from Newtown, I live just here. But no, then I found out actually it's all weekend after I agreed and it's going to be Friday to Sunday and it's three hours down the south coast and I was feeling really tired and I thought I'm an introvert, this is going to absolutely exhaust me, there's going to be so much traffic on the Princess Highway Friday afternoon, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the short story is um, it was absolutely refreshing. I'd never met any of these women before in my life and in God's kindness um, 
it was an absolute literal godsend, okay? And um, I drove back up the highway soundly rebuked on the, the Sunday um, afternoon. And also symbolically, I fell over twice on the weekend, like once I sat on a chair actually and it just it completely smashed and I landed on my bottom. And then straight after that, I landed <laughs> flat on my face. And I thought this is quite symbolic of God actually saying, Jane, I know what I'm doing. You don't know what you're doing. So anyway, yeah. Um, I worry when some single people in ministry have said to me that they avoid going to the shops on their day off in case they see someone from church. And that is, you know, that is what they do every day off, okay? Not just occasionally. Now, that person you bump into may be refreshing, okay? Um, we can make it into a massive negative thing. Even if it's a tricky person, it doesn't necessarily have to take all your day off. And it's, um, I'm just worried also, it can end up being this very much us and them mentality, um, maybe we've made the issue bigger than it is. Maybe we're actually making life harder for ourselves. We think we're making it easier, but we may actually be making life harder for ourselves, okay? If it is that you're in this way of thinking, I, I'd really strongly recommend you speak maybe to an elder or, or another staff member or you know, a wiser parishioner at your church, okay, or in what, um, your ministry situation. I worry also when single people in ministry say to me that they... They never go to the movies or to a cafe because they don't have anyone to go with. Please just try and go by yourself, okay? So many people do that nowadays. Um, do you think people are going to look at you and think, oh, she or he's a real loser? <laughs> like, if they do, that's their problem. They're the loser, okay? That's their insecurity, their issue. Chances are they won't even notice you sitting there by yourself. They're too busy getting on living their life, okay? Or they might be sitting there thinking, wow, he or she, you know, they've got a lot of confidence to be able to, you know, sit and enjoy a meal at a cafe by themselves. And you don't need to pretend to be doing something on your phone or pretend to be reading a book. You might want to read a book or do something on your phone, but you don't need to. It just becomes easier just to do it, okay? So some of us, you may be thinking, Jane, why are you saying this? I love going to a cafe by myself. But for others of us, we really freak out about it. So if, it, if that's a word for you, that's a word for you, okay? Um, yeah, and it's rather than just watching Netflix or stand by yourself, um, there's time and place for that. But actually getting out, going to the movies, the whole experience can be helpful, you know, physically, mentally, okay? Um, another thing to watch out for is don't focus on so much on differences. As humans, a natural thing we want to do is focus on differences and we live in fear of differences as well. We want people to be like us, to make us feel more secure. Well, don't believe Satan's lie that the differences are too great between us, okay, or too important at times. I mean, sometimes they're important, dif important differences, but remember we're all human, created in God's image, don't believe Satan's lie that you can't speak to me in my condition if you're a married person. So Peter, he can, as a married person, Julia, they can speak to me about singleness, okay? And I can speak to them about marriage, okay? Um, this is a bit of a random one. 12, getting a pet, okay? <laughs> I, I don't actually have pets, but... For some people, they've been really helpful, okay? So from some people I know, and obviously this is not just single people, but I'm thinking of some single people now that I know, getting a pet has helped them not feel so lonely, okay? And helped them physically, their physical and mental health enormously, okay? Now, if you wondered about whether to get a cat or a dog, maybe you've seen those videos online from the US <laughs> Defence Forces of when um, return service men and women return home and the different reactions. So the dogs are really, really happy to see their owners. Cats, not so much at all, okay? <laughs> so maybe you, want, maybe you want to weigh that if you're trying to work out whether to get a dog or cat, okay? <laughs> One of my friends, her mental health and her physical health has hugely increased by getting a dog because it forces her to have to take the dog for a walk, things like that, okay? Um, another thing, get on and live your life. God knows exactly what he's doing, okay, and it's good. That doesn't mean it's not difficult at times, but it's going to be all the more difficult if you're not saying yes to Jesus and saying yes more to self, as you'll always be discontent, okay? Um, another thing to remember is that grief is real. Remember the norm of, the life, of this life is suffering. There is lots of great things, but this world is fallen, it's weak, it's temporary, our ultimate reality is coming and will last forever and there will be no more sin, no more incompleteness. Um, another thing which mentioned before 
but just want to say again, accepting your body as a physical body, okay? I, I won't, I just put it out there, just remember it, okay? It's really important. Um, also, another thing to watch out for as a single person, it can be really easy to be selfish, okay? You might say, well, I'm not selfish as a single person. I'm, I'm actually really selfish and it's very, very easy to be selfish, okay? I'll just leave that with you, all right? Um, loneliness. My experience is that it can be harder for those previously married. Um, they, um, yeah, it's, it's just very, very painful. So when you're thinking pastorally also about different people that you're responsible for, um, but all of us can experience loneliness, can't we, whatever our marital status. But for those who have been married before and then find themselves single again, they seem to be extremely so. Um, yeah. Um, and one last thing, remember that you'll die in the Lord. Now, that may not sound cheery to you. The opposite is the, there's only one other option and you don't want that, okay? As Christians, we will die well in that we'll die in the Lord. It might be painful. It might be scary. You might be thinking, as a single person, am I going to die alone? Um, so the process might be, quite, might be quite painful, might be quite sad, might be alone, but ultimately God has a hold on us, okay? And he will be there on the other side for you. And then just for you to look at later, um, there's examples of four different exercises you may want to do that will help you think about singleness. I just want to close with some words from Sam Aubrey. Um, so being human, single or married, is all about trusting God, our creator and redeemer at his word. Um, it's good and perfect word. And Sam said, um, Adam in his garden said, not your will, but mine. And he brought death. Jesus in his garden said, not my will, but yours and brought life. So who are you going to put your trust in? A leader who can give you a moment, you know, or the everlasting God, okay? And a lot of temptations for the single person is actually just the moment and they are really deceptive and they can be a lie, okay? So where is your faith? We can trust God at his word on what he says about singleness.